All right, and we are live. So welcome back to DAP University. So today we got a lot to talk in our live talk about in our live stream. We're first going to start off with the avalanche uh, conspiracy that's floating around that everybody's talking about, and I'm going to break this down and what you need to understand about that. We're going to look at a lot of other news updates that have happened in the space since yesterday. Again, we do these live streams Monday through Friday. This channel, just subscribe, turn on notifications. You're going to find out about those whenever we go live. Uh, we're going to take a quick look at the crypto markets, answer some of your questions, and a whole lot more. So if you're around here, hey, I'm Gregory, and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to master blockchain step by step start to finish, definitely head on over to dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. All right, so we got people jumping in the chat here. We got technically uh, Dale Kodia, Above Realty, Jay Lee, uh, Automatic Beats, DT, R Doll, Barry, uh, Bad Boy, Bowie, something like that. Hope I'm saying that right. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so let's let's jump into this, okay? So yesterday on stream, uh, you know, somebody brought up uh, the news has been going around about Avalanche, especially with Ava Labs, as uh, pertains to uh, this legal firm that has, you know, been been kind of brought up this conspiracy with crypto leaks that's been floating on the internet. We've seen a lot of uh, mud slinging on uh, Twitter. We've seen lots of different, uh, you know, things about this. And you know, yesterday I said I didn't really have enough information on what was going on to really speak on it. Uh, but I spent a little more time with this and wanted to uh, kind of just dive in and you know just talk about what you need to know if you haven't uh, heard about this yet and sort of what the current status of this particular uh, issue is, okay? So let's, let's start off with the who, what, when, where, why, okay? So we're talking about Avalanche, okay? So the uh, smart contract platform blockchain. Let's just see here. I'm going to pull this up. <clears throat> so Avalanche, um, let's see, AVAX... Uh, the blockchain, okay, smart contract platform is an EVM compatible chain, so it works uh, somewhat like Ethereum, okay, with some key differences. Okay, you can basically take Ethereum smart contracts, put them on Avalanche, uh, bootstrap their ecosystem. They have they have several novel design mechanisms that differentiate from them, but that they're kind of you know they're trying to do a very similar type of thing. Uh, so, anyways, Avalanche uh, is the blockchain in question here. We saw the price of the crypto uh, tank pretty hard over the weekend around this, the time this news came out. Um, so that's that's sort of the the what. So let's talk about the who. So Ava Labs is the uh, company that essentially that builds the technology that powers Avalanche. So people ask all the time, like, hey, who makes blockchains in the first place? If they're just um, you know these decentralized things that run out in the community, well, sometimes it it is a uh, you know decentralized community who you know maintains these projects and governs them once they're off the ground, but usually uh, an initial, uh, you know, private entity of sometimes you have some type is the genesis of these ideas in the first place, and that's sort of who Ava Labs is in, in this case. So, uh, anyway, so what's the what's the you know what's the news? What's the story? What's what's going on here? So basically, we saw uh, this website. So crypto leaks come out over the weekend. Uh, you might have seen this already, but but I'm just going to kind of you know break it down in case uh, you all are not familiar with what's going on here. Uh, so basically, uh, a series of videos came out, right, which you can watch. I'm not going to play them on my screen all, all here, but you can kind of get an idea. Anyways, uh, I'm not going to watch through all the videos, but I just want to give you a taste of what's inside this. So basically, it's it's these like uh, it's a conversation uh, between um, it, it, it is a filmed conversation that um, essentially the person who's speaking doesn't like necessarily realize if they're being recorded on camera. At least that was the response uh, to this from Roche. Okay, but so so what is it basically? Um, it, <clears throat> Excuse me. So basically, um, uh, Roche Friedman is the law firm essentially that was connected with uh, Avalanche in the early days, and that's what we're seeing here. Uh, essentially, uh, are some videos of, of of somebody. I can't really technically tell who it is. Uh, the voice is kind of like distorted in the videos. I think it's intentional. Uh, asking this person questions, okay, over and over and over again, talking about, hey, what's your involvement with the project? Like, did you receive any token allocation their project? What did you do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And so you have this building case where, uh, you know, it comes out that essentially 
uh, you know, they retain the legal services for a, sh you know, a share of upside and the token and the network um, to essentially, you know, do two things. One is basically like keep regulations, uh, keep regulators away uh, from the project, but also like try to, uh, you know, essentially, uh, essentially like, you know, uh, pursue legal action against competitors to try to slow them down. Okay, so let's let's kind of go through some of that. So basically, an anonymous Twitter account is the one that leaked this. Claimed they would leak ten, would leak thousands of Telegram messages that would uh, expose rife criminality in the crypto sector. <laughs> okay, um, even though that particular leak hasn't materialized yet, we do have the videos. All right, so um, we we saw that recently. Um, Sorry, I want to go back. Yes, the hidden camera is basically talking about Kyle Roche. That's who I was talking about before from Roche Friedman. That's who's on video here. Founding partner of Roche Friedman Law Firm. Uh, talking about his, his relationship with Ava Labs. Okay. Um, yeah, this is what I was talking about here. Uh, basically, you know, had their relationship to file class action lawsuits against major uh, operators in the crypto space, including Solana Labs. Okay, it's definitely a direct competitor to Avalanche, what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, basically, the crypto leaks alleges that Roche Freeman secretly filed suits against Solana, Definity, okay, who does uh, internet computer, okay, and other blockchain operators on behalf of Ava Labs and its executives. So we see some response from this, okay. Especially from uh, Ava's, Ava's founders talking about how they they completely denied the claims. You know, they they chalk it up to a co complete conspiracy uh, allegations. The, basically, the direct quote is the allegations of the site are categorically false. So Ava Labs believe in the transparency and facing the world head on, not through behind the scenes dealing or activity. Okay, neither I nor anyone else at Ava Labs ever directed Roche in his selection of cases. We do not receive. Uh, materials or information from him, and we do not entrust our legal uh, affairs to him. Okay, so basically, Ava Labs worked with Roche Friedman in its early days, representing the company in a defensive capacity, is what he said. Okay, uh, in a libel case, uh, but basically, he added that uh, he they did file the class action lawsuits independently, and that Ava Labs was livid when it learned of the Solana cases. So the Solana cases are legit. They're real, okay? But I think what we're kind of seeing here is a denial that they were the uh, sort of initiator of those efforts. Uh, I also deny that Kyle Roche had any influence at Ava Labs, despite claims that in the crypto leaks uh, post that holds a substantial slum of tokens and equity in the operation. Okay, Roche also published a response uh, saying there's false statements. Uh, we'll talk about the market reaction. So <laughs> I think one of the big uh, reasons that we saw you know, markets kind of dump for AVAX in particular is because in the videos he's talking about like the, the guy's trying to fish out. He's like, how you know, trying to fish out how much, how many tokens this guy holds. Uh, so again, you know, I, I, again, I'm, I'm not weighing in on, on all of this necessarily, but I'm talking about how the internet's perceiving this. Okay. And sort of trying to talk about, explain the market reaction. So Basically, you know, the videos guys try to suss out. He's like, you know, so how, how many tokens he got? And he kind of wants to like say, oh, what, what, what? And not really explain uh, or not even give a straight answer. And he kind of keeps fishing it out of him. He's like, all right, so so how many tokens, how, what percentage of the tokens do you have? It's like, yeah, about a point. <laughs> so basically, uh, I think that's what the market's freaking out about mostly. Number one, well, number one, it's the sentiment, right? The sentiment against... Uh, uh, the entire project itself, but also the fact that you know somebody is, uh, you know, packing one percent of uh, the token supply, but it was plus the equity, uh, plus the private equity in the project as well. So um, you know, at one percent of that market cap uh, would be a significant amount of money that could put a substantial amount of sell pressure on the asset itself. So, uh, anyways, that's sort of what everybody's been talking about. <laughs> and it's probably going to take us some time before we find out what all the uh, final truth about this type of thing is. Again, I'm not, you know, I, I personally think that we need, uh, you know, more, um, more, more, more to come out about this and see what, you know, actual legal uh, settlement is on this type of situation because it's always really hard to tell when you're piecing together information from the internet where you don't have personal involvement in the situation and you don't have really any way to corroborate uh, what the 
uh, facts are uh, when you're this far removed. But that being said, I mean, it doesn't look good from the surface. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't want to just like sit back and take everything at face value here because it definitely looks like there are uh, some things that are hard to know exactly what to trust. Um, so time, time will definitely tell, but that's, you know, what everybody's talking about. Those are the key players in this situation. Um, that's what the market's worried about. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much what we know up to this point. So let me know what y'all think down, uh, in the comment section below. Do you think it's all legit? Do you think it's all fake? So, Amadeo thinks it's it's real. So I guess he thinks it's one hundred percent legit. Definitely possible. It's got to hold some truth. It's real. Let's see here, I think people need to knock. <laughs> This crap if crypto is a game mainstream adoption. Well, the thing about it is, um, you know, this type of behavior is not unique to crypto. Like, if this is legit, like, this this stuff goes down uh, behind the scenes all the time. Now, it's a different, yeah, it's a different ball game because there's definitely some gray area in terms of crypto regulations uh, as it pertains to security laws, all that type of stuff. Um, so, you know, that's going to attract a certain type of person to try to pull off some of these more uh, gray area <laughs> type of behaviors, all right? Um, whereas like somebody who's operating in more traditional, um, you know, capacities may think twice before trying to do something like that, especially anybody who has like any uh, interest in becoming a C-level executive or something like that. You could definitely be barred from ever holding that office again if you uh, violate certain certain laws like this. Was this too many coincidences? Okay, so um, let's talk about a couple of things that happened in the space since yesterday. I, want to I don't want to spend all day on the avalanche uh, stuff here, but I want to bring that up because that's what everybody on the internet's talking about. And I want to give you all um, sort of a summary of what we actually know and what we don't totally know just yet. So um, tomorrow we definitely have Arbitrum Nitro going live. Well, actually, let's let's talk about Arbitrum Nitro uh, as it relates to the Ethereum merge. So we've got the Ethereum merge coming up really soon. Okay, we're officially 16 days away. Tomorrow will be 15 days. I'll probably put another tweet out on my Twitter. <laughs> Got to remind y'all about that. You know, we're basically we're we're just a little over two weeks away. So this is a huge, huge, huge deal. You know, Ethereum is switching to proof of stake. Um, you know, uh, w w the estimated date is September 15th. It could actually be a little bit ahead of that. It could be a little bit behind that. Uh, there's a range because the merge is based on total terminal difficulty, basically how hard it is to produce blocks on the network, okay? And uh, whenever that, uh, you know, there's a lot of variables that affect the total terminal difficulty, like energy costs, crypto prices, um, all that type of stuff, okay? And... Um, uh, anyway, so but the, but if if we stick if if our estimate is actually correct, uh, then it's September fifteenth. That's very close. Uh, of course, this is uh, the largest change to Ethereum ever, ever since its launch. Okay, and one of the biggest uh, events in all of crypto's history um, because of number one technological innovation, but number two the actual economic impact on the price of Ether. Uh, itself, okay. So people always get excited about the Bitcoin halvings because the amount of new Bitcoin created every block gets cut in half once every four years. That's sort of like a, a big event people look forward to. Well, ETH's about to undergo the triple halving, uh, once and only once, where the supply issuance is reduced, uh, is cut in half three times, which is is a little over a ninety percent reduction in actual ETH issuance. 
uh, per block, per day, per year, et cetera, et cetera. And we're also burning ETH whenever new transactions are created. And so whenever that happens, uh, that can, if we have enough network activity, that can offset the issuance. So that basically means less ETH every year if we keep network tech activity up, okay? Um, on 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 larger time frames, on shorter time frames, it might not be deflationary. But if we have uh, peak network activity and that continues to trend higher over time, then we can definitely have a deflationary ETH. Uh, so, anyways, that's that's just a little over two weeks away, maybe even less than two weeks away, depending on how fast we reach total terminal difficulty. But we're seeing that plus a confluence of other uh, great scaling solutions start to really gain momentum and traction uh yesterday we talked about zk sync being 60 days away from the mainnet uh launch the zk sync 2.0 and then tomorrow we have arbitrum nitro uh turning on so let's just pull that up so why is this important well basically you know everybody i'm still i keep repeating this but i'll keep repeating it until people realize what's up um you know, I, I'm still seeing major, 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 you know, accounts talk about how excited they are that ETH's, uh, the ETH 2.0, the merge, uh, Ethereum switching to proof of stake is going to reduce ETH gas fees. And for that reason, they're so excited about the merge. Well, it's like, that's not going to happen. Um, you know, if you've been watching these live streams, this channel at all, you know, you've heard me explain that a bazillion times. Um, but that's that's okay. That's the bad news. But the good news is that's what layer two scaling solutions are for. Okay, and so that that's an example of what I'm talking about here with Arbitrum, and then also um, also uh, uh, zk sync 2.0, which I was just talking about. Let's just see here. So, anyways, Arbitrum Nitro is going live tomorrow, so this is a big deal because we're seeing Layer 2 adoption really continue to uh, take off. We're seeing Layer 2 ship scaling solutions and improvements, which is really good for the entire ETH space, okay? Um, so, what is Nitro? So, basically, it's going to have that benefit of faster transactions, lower fees, okay, better user experience for building applications, most advanced roll-up stack ever built. That's what they're, that's what they're sort of calling this, so... It's basically um, Arbitrum, but better, okay? Uh, so some core features are basically uh, using fraud proofs with WebAssembly. So WebAssembly was sort of like really talked about and sort of hyped up for a long time, especially in the early days of development towards Ethereum 2.0, okay? Um, but basically, it's, it's a new engine, Um that can be written and compiled using standard languages and tools or placing the custom design language compiler used today. Basically, it's going to run um, and compile native code switching to WebAssembly if fraud proof is needed. So anyways, we got Arbitrum Nitro shipping tomorrow. We've got a ZK Sync mainnet uh, in less than 60 days now. We've got the ETH merge just around the corner uh, next month. Hard to believe that September 1st is upon us. September 1st is that's tomorrow, right? Let's just see here. Yeah, no, wait, hold on. No, it's not tomorrow. It's the next day. Tomorrow is August 31st. Uh, September 1st is Thursday. What's today, Tuesday? I get my days mixed up now. Somebody says, so a proof of stake crypto is not mineable like proof of work. That is correct. Uh, so basically, like Ethereum is moving from proof of work to proof of stake, which means the miners are getting replaced by validators. So that's what the like. So miners are essentially um, the people who mine blocks. They create. They're the ones who basically create new blocks on the blockchain. Uh, so basically, whenever you do a transaction, let's say right connect like right now on Ethereum. Uh, I sent cryptocurrency from my account to yours. That's a simple transaction. So that transaction is going to get its own transaction record on the blockchain. That's going to get included with a bunch of other transactions into a block. All right. You know, we basically just see how many, uh, you know, yeah, basically those, those transactions get grouped together in bundles of records called blocks, which are chained together to make up the blockchain. Okay. And so the computers that facilitate that transaction and uh, essentially... I don't want to use the word validate because they're miners, but basically the ones who 
prove that it's valid, okay, and work together to do that, and then include it into the block. That's, that's what miners do right now on Ethereum, okay? And they're the ones that get paid both by the blockchain, by creating new Ether, and also by part of the fees that you send to them, okay? So basically, whenever you switch a proof of stake, um, they are going to get swapped out for validators or stakers, I guess you could say in this case. And the validators, the ones that do the same thing, basically, you know, in a general sense. Uh, but instead of like solving cryptographic puzzles like miners do, they stake their cryptocurrency, they lock it up into their computer, um, they earn a passive income reward for honestly validating transactions, including them into blocks. But basically, if they try to validate a bad transaction um, or like act dishonestly in any way, whether that's out of malice or just incompetence, then they get penalized by like basically they have to have cryptocurrency and they can lose cryptocurrency for trying to, uh, you know, for whether it's accidentally or on purpose, putting bad data into the blockchain. So as much as if anybody talks about what happens to NFTs on the proof of work chain, the switch will just replicate what already exists on the chain. We'll have to uh, honor the NFTs in the POS chain. So it's a good question. So, you know, after the ETH, uh, two, two things. One, let's talk about NFTs and let's talk about the proof of work chain. So there's a good comment in the comment section below. Uh, basically, let's just see here. I'm not sure why my, oh, I have a, a, a video on YouTube that started playing. Uh, let me kill that. Uh, so anyways, um, let's look at this. Let's talk about NFTs for a second because yesterday we saw that, um, you know, Meta is now letting users connect digital wallets and post NFTs across Facebook and Instagram. Okay. So this is a pretty big deal. Um, essentially, you can connect your wallet to your account, uh, prove that you have the ownership of an NFT, and then you basically have a verified digital collectible. So um, I think this is actually a pretty big deal because this actually unlocks, you know, sort of the code for this really changes. Uh, this could change the dynamic of social media entirely, especially if you see this integrated into bigger social media platforms like Instagram and Facebook. So number one, it's already pretty cool that you can just have digital artwork and uh, post it to social media, right? But like what happens if uh, essentially you could uh, post any digital media content, okay, uh, and then verify that you own that? So essentially you could you could – own a post and then you know facebook sure could you could you could amplify that on facebook you could amplify on instagram but you could essentially like prove that you were the owner or the creator of that post or really the first person to put it on chain so there's some interesting things with this right like so i see this all the time people like stealing content on the internet right taking screenshots of posts and like reposting them on on instagram for example and then like if you but what if you posted that as an nft all right and it was you know, provable that you were the one who created it in the first place. And now you can still screenshot it and be like the first person to maybe put it on a blockchain. But there's still ways where you could like, you could still like increase the likelihood that you were the first person to come up with the idea. Okay. By like, you know, time stamping it on the blockchain. And then, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen like, like the Google reverse image search where you can like put an image into Google and it'll find similar images. Like typically, like if you, if you put in an image, it'll find exact matches of it that are indexed across the internet. So you can do a similar type of thing where you're like indexing content on chain to where like you could actually, you know, not necessarily prove, but like have a pretty good likelihood that you were the original person to post this to social media, which could solve the problem of people like ripping off content. Uh, you see this all the time, like people like watermarking their pictures or they have like, you know, their Instagram handle like in the, uh, 
you know, you see it like like in the in the picture somewhere. Like like people who post memes on Instagram are like the worst offenders with this because they they're just like lazy. They don't really want to do uh, any work. They just want to like go steal other people's stuff and then repost it, right? Uh, you see this all the time happening across platforms as well. Like it's like like cross platform arbitrage where people just go like look up posts on Reddit and then post it on Instagram or vice versa, right? Uh, so like basically. You know, NFTs could create the ability to, you know, uniquely prove that you were the creator of certain content on the internet at all, especially image content. Okay, and then if that image content's ever reposted across like any platform, whether that was lifted from a platform and put onto another, like it could all be tied back to your wallet, uh, which could be a pretty interesting use case here. Now, there's like there's some still questions that you'd have to answer in order to prove how to do this, but. Um, you know, it's a, it's a novel use case, I think. Um, so speaking of NFTs, so, so the reason we were talking about NFTs in the first place, I was asking about how, what happens to NFTs on the proof of stake chain. Uh, cause you know, we have the, basically we have a theorem right now of NFTs. Are they going to move over? So they will move over, uh, to the new chain okay whenever ethereum forks but there's always a question of like are we going to have an actual fork where one chain stays behind okay and then you sort of have you know now you have two nfts basically on one chain and then on another chain so uh, for the longest time i didn't think that we'd see you know a lot of uh we i didn't think we'd see a viable remnant stay behind but we're seeing more and more push for an Ethereum proof of work version to be maintained. Um, we're just gonna have to see what happens. I, I've I've brought this up multiple times, but now we're seeing more and more, uh, you know, more and more resistance from Ethereum proof of work or ETHW. Okay, so yesterday, I believe it was yesterday. Let's see here. Yeah, yesterday they published an open letter to the Ethereum community. Now, you know, ETHW has been controversial, to say the least, in the past few weeks. Uh, ETH Core feels compelled to clarify a few points. Uh, basically, who are the members? That's what they talk about right here. Uh, why they choose to stay anonymous. Okay. Um, anyways, I'll let you all go through this, but they're, they're, not, they're not slowing down. Okay. You know, resistance is mounting. Uh, and so, it, you know, we're going to have to see what happens with this post ethereum merge it'll be some in the very least it'll be some interesting drama you know over the long term i i still just am pretty skeptical about the viability of a proof of work version of ethereum to really gain any significant adoption um you know you can already trade the iou for the airdrop tokens and uh you know the the price action on that doesn't look you know great <laughs> okay so if the, if the mark is any indication of what it thinks about the eth proof of work uh fork you know it's not a good start when are chains going to talk to each other bro well chains do already talk to each other that's what blockchain bridges are for um bridges are a pretty big central point of failure um you know we need bridges to to you know transfer funds between chains without moving to cryptocurrency exchanges bridges have been some of the biggest uh victims of crypto hacks and exploits um you know it's it's hard to say like will bridges get better i think they can get better um, when we start introducing novel ways of cryptography to help with the security, because right now most of them are kind of brittle in how they actually implement their security. Um, but assuming that doesn't happen, you know, that's kind of, I don't know, like that's kind of bleeds the incentives to basically, uh, flourish on a handful of ecosystems and not constantly be moving around between ecosystems. So that, you know, that's sort of a point in the, uh side of the balance of you know only a small number of networks really gaining long-term viability and adoption
Somebody says, like, if you have two of the same NFT on two blockchains with the same IPFS address, obviously the NFT on the other blockchain will not be honored. Yeah, this is the same problem with stable coins or any other cryptocurrency. Like, if the blockchain forks into two chains, you know, and you, your account it automatically has, uh, you know, crypto on both chains, then it's up to the issuer to decide which one it wants to honor. Now, I mean, the NFT community could honor both and just say, like, your other one is just, uh, you know, lesser value. Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I'm just not counting on... I'm not counting on the assets that you would get for free on a fork to be worth anything. You might get lucky. You might get a couple uh, things here and there. Who knows if, you know, crazy things happen in crypto bull markets. If a bull market comes back and then, you know, all the cool kids start trading um you know forked nfts or something or derivative nfts then maybe you could catch a little bit of the hype off of that i don't know but uh you know i, I wouldn't i wouldn't count on it all right buddy so that's all i got for today as always smash that like button down below for the youtube algorithm subscribe to this channel if you haven't already that really helps these videos out so we learn about blockchain and if you're as fast with this technology as i am you want to get your hands dirty i can get started today Waiting on my YouTube homepage, you, know, you can find those free courses there. They're like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. And if you like those, you want to take the next step, or hey, maybe you want to take a master's work entirely, you know, become a web 3 pointer developer, land your first blockchain job, I can share to do that over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You know, you don't have to be an expert to get started right now today. I thought people with zero coding experience become real world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. Until next time, thanks for watching.